What's going on everyone? This is Theo from headphones.com and today I have a review for you of the 64 Audio A4S. This is their latest model, a hybrid that meshes a dynamic driver and three balanced armatures and clocks in at I want to say $1,100. I actually reached out a little while back expressing interest in a 64 Audio A4T and I was told to sit tight because they had some stuff in the pipeline. And well, this was the result. In this review, I'll also be talking a little bit about the CIM process because this is my first time getting a custom in-ear monitor. And of course, I'll be talking about the A4S as well and how I think it stacks up in the sort of kilobuck price territory. Full disclosure, this unit was provided for review by 64 Audio. As always, what follows are my honest thoughts and opinions to the best of my ability. Let's get right into it. Okay, so first things first, I thought I would talk a little bit about the process of getting a CIM. It's not like a thing with universal IMs. We can just go out and buy one on the secondary market or place an order and expect it in a couple of days. There are definitely some logistics involved and personally this is what kept me from going for a CIM up until this point. Anyways, the first thing that you're going to want to do is make an appointment with your local audiologist. Once you've made that appointment and you've showed up, the first thing that they're going to do is check your ears to make sure that you have no earwax in them. Luckily this was not the case for me and it might have helped that I was wearing my Eric 2XRs the other day, which sort of just clean out your ears if you know what I mean. But um, yeah, after that they are going to insert a piece of foam, a small piece of foam with a piece of string attached into your ear canal. Um, that piece of foam is going to be used as a stopper to prevent the impression material from going any deeper, and then that piece of string is going to be used at the end to pull the impression material out. With that being said, this is probably the most uncomfortable part of the process, and at least for me, um, it was right at that threshold of where it was starting to be painful. Like, they asked me like, hey, just let me know if it hurts. I was like, uh, I'm not sure. It's like really, really uncomfortable, but it's not quite painful yet. But yeah, just a heads up on that part. At this point, after they have inserted that piece of foam, they're going to have you bite down on a bite block. Or in my case, it was a popsicle stick. But uh, yeah, this is to stabilize your jaw and so that the impression material doesn't get sort of like warped if you're um, moving your jaw during the process. Next, the audiologist is going to fill your ears with the actual impression material. And honestly, this part is painless and it's just gonna give you the impression that you're hearing things from underwater. Um, it's very, very isolating and the material is just gonna sit in your ears for a few minutes and um, take shape. And at that point, the audiologist is going to pull up the uh, impressions using the piece of foam and voila, you have your impressions. All in all, it took me about 20 minutes and uh, about $100, I think, for both sets of my impressions. Those prices will probably vary depending on where you get your impressions done, but I probably wouldn't expect them to cost too much more than that. After this, I mailed the impressions off to 64 Audio, and I think the entire turnaround time from when I got the impressions done to when I had the actual IMs in my hands was roughly two and a half weeks. So granted, I did have rush processing, but it was a lot less of an intensive process than I thought. And on the bright side, 64 Audio also stores your um, impressions as an STL file for future reference if you decide to purchase another IM from them. Diving into what you're going to get with the A4S, the included accessories are honestly pretty sparse. Here you have their aluminum hockey puck case, which I find to be a major step up over the old plastic case. The best part about this case though is that it contains a clever foam insert in the lid with slots for accessories. Here you can store a cleaning tool, desiccant, and various Apex modules, of which one M20 Apex module is included with the A4S. Anyways, I don't think I've seen any other manufacturer design something like this, which is pretty sweet. I'd maybe just suggest a rubber lining to make cleaning easier, especially because you're storing CIMs in here, which tend to build up your wax easier when you have them in. Taking a look at the A4S itself, I went with the brushed aluminum finish. Because this is a CIM, you of course have the option of tailoring the aesthetics completely to your specifications. 64 Audio has a very useful online tool on their website that you can play around with to check out possible combinations. Personally, I think these turned out fantastic, and the build quality is also top notch. There are zero blemishes, hairline edges, or anything of that nature that I normally look for when assessing build quality. Now, the cable that came with mine is a little bit different in that it's a cable that 64 Audio is currently prototyping. So, not everything is quite set in stone with it, and they are mainly looking for feedback on it. Anyways, I think this cable is another step in the right direction from their past cables, which were, if I'm being perfectly honest, some of the worst ones that I've ever handled. <laughs> The material being used on this cable is very pliable and it is non-microphonic as well. I don't know if it'll be worth what it's going to cost, um, I kind of doubt it, but I definitely like it minus the memory wire. Moving on, we need to talk about the fit and the comfort, because this is where CIMs really make their mark. It was a little awkward wearing the A4S at first, because I'd never worn a CIM before, but after using the A4S for a couple of weeks, I have to say that I'm pretty sold. 
the isolation on these is absolutely fantastic. And the best part is that you also don't get any pressure buildup because of the Apex technology. Anyways, no problems keeping these in for five plus hours at a time, no joke. I've actually fallen asleep with them multiple times and you can sort of lay on your side even because they sit fairly flush with your ear. Just be aware that because CIMs sit deeper in your ear canal than a traditional IM, earworks does tend to build up easier and you'll have to clean them more frequently. On the bright side, you won't have to worry about ear tips. All right, so let's talk about how the A4S actually sounds. And as usual, I will throw up the frequency response graph on screen for you guys' reference. Just be aware that I had to take this measurement using putty to form a seal around the IM and the coupler. So I wouldn't really trust the accuracy of the measurements, especially after 5K Hertz. Even just small adjustments in the placement of the IM on the coupler would make big differences in the measurements. And as a result, I don't really think there's much comparability between the CIM measurements and the UIM measurements that you're going to probably make on a uh, graph comparison tool. With that being said, the overall tonality of the A4S is along the lines of neutral with sub bass boost. And speaking of the sub bass, there is quite a lot of it here. And I want to say it's around 13 decibels over 1k hertz at its peak in the sub bass, which for reference is a ton of sub bass, um, almost ridiculous amounts of sub bass, probably not on par with like the, some of the Empire Ear stuff, but a lot of sub bass nonetheless. The closest point of comparison here would no doubt be the The Audio Monarch. And you can see on the graph that they graph very similarly. I think that the A4S just has a little bit more uh, 100 to 200 hertz, which I personally prefer because it lends to a slightly warmer bass response. But um, yeah, pretty similar overall. But with that being said, I think that on an intangible level, on a technical level, the bass on the A4S is just a little bit better. The thing about the Monarch is that it has a dynamic driver and balanced armatures for the bass. Like they're both tokening the bass frequencies. And as a result, it comes off a little bit plasticky and I don't think it slams as hard as it should. By contrast, while I think that the A4S could use with some more bass texture, it sounds a little bit too dry in the bass for me. It does slam harder from memory and it's also definitely more coherent as well. The actual calling card of the A4S though, I think in terms of the bass, would be the sheer extension. I don't know if it's because it's a CIM and it's just able to sort of better articulate those lowest frequencies, but the extension, the 30 hertz frequencies, the 20 hertz frequencies, are absolutely incredible on the A4S. In fact, I was playing around with a frequency response generator in Roo, and I could actually feel under 20 hertz, not hear under 20 hertz, of course, but I could feel under 20 hertz. And I'm talking like 19, 18 hertz, but still, that is pretty darn incredible. But yeah, overall, fantastic bass response. This is probably the best bass response that I've heard at a kilobuck. And I could say that because the IE900 actually clocks in at $1,300, which is like, I think $200 more than this is going to be priced at. So the mid-range of the A4S is pretty much just as solid as the bass response, and it is what I've come to associate with being uh, 64 Audio's default tuning. It is a flatter lower mid-range without any bloat, and then it is followed by a rise from like 1 to 2k Hz for a more gentle pinot compensation, and then a slight recession from, I want to say, 3 to 4k Hz in the presence regions. The effect of this is that you do lose some bite with female vocals and instruments like electric guitars in particular, but I think that this is a recession that has been done correctly for a more relaxed presentation that isn't going to offend anyone. Now the trouble, however, is where I can't say I'm necessarily a fan of the A4S sound. Um, earlier I said not to trust the frequency response graph that I showed on the screen, and I still stand by that, but I did sign sweep this by ear too, and it sort of corroborates what I've been hearing. When I first heard it, I honestly didn't think there was really anything wrong with the treble response, and then I A-beat it with the, uh, the Symphonium Helios, and at that point, I knew that while it wasn't offensive at all, there were definitely parts of the treble on the A4S that were sort of lacking. And along these lines, it doesn't really have much energy at 5K Hertz, and I also feel like there were some dips in the mid treble from like 5 to 10K Hertz or so. It's still far from being rolled off though, because it has those characteristic Tia peaks for air at around like 15 or 16K Hertz. It's crazy high up, but it's definitely present, and you can sort of hear that zing at times. Uh, but yeah, just not enough lower treble and mid treble in my opinion, and this sort of lends to sort of a light and feathery tactility to the way percussive instruments are hit. Um, I think that might be a good thing, I guess, depending on the sort of treble presentation that you're after. But with things like finger snaps and percussive hits again, I do feel like they're lacking that initial sense of crack to when the um, instrument or the, the fingers hit. So yeah, overall, really solid tuning that is really only marred by the treble response. And again, the treble response is not bad at all. It's not rolled off, it's not offensive, it's just not up to par when you compare it to something like the Helios, the Moondrop S8, or even the The Audio uh, Monarch and Clairvoyance in the sort of linearity of the treble response, I guess I'd say, especially in those lower and mid-treble regions again. 
Okay, so let's talk about the technical performance of the A4S. I would say that the A4S definitely has surface level detail down, and this is in the sense that I wouldn't bat an eye at calling it reasonably technical on first listen, but it's when I start listening more closely, I start running A-B tests that I do find it to be lacking a little bit. And here there's a noticeable gap between IMs like the Helios and the S8 again that are indexing for a more technical sound. I really just don't think that the A4S is quite on the same level. With that being said, technicalities are difficult to assess, especially when it comes to sheer detail retrieval. And the A4S is honestly perfectly reasonable for daily driver use in my opinion. So my main gripe with the A4S would actually be the timbre. The timbre of the A4S in my opinion is kind of plasticky. It's not, it's not gritty in the decay where it has that like sort of overlap to it. It's like something like the Moondrop Blessing 2 does, which is, God, that IM has awful BA timbre but the A4S just leans more plasticky in general. I wanna say that part of this might have to do with the sort of recession in the treble response. It might be negatively impacting other parts of the frequency response, but honestly, it might just come down to the drivers that are being used. I don't know. Um, I will say though that I have heard better on this front, and this is especially apparent in comparison with the even the uh, U60 from 64 Audio. Moving on to imaging performance, I would say that it is above average, but not best in class. Localization is reasonably good, and unlike some of 64 Audio's other IMs like the U12T, the U6T, and the U18S, notes on the A4S tend to lean towards the larger side and they're a little bit more enveloping around you. Um, I would probably say it's most similar to the U18T in this respect from memory, but I actually haven't A-B'd them, so I can't speak to that completely. In terms of dynamics, I would say that the A4S does not really have great macrodynamic contrast, at least in the sense that it's scaling um, decibel gradations and volume, but it does have a good sense of punchiness to it, especially when it comes to the bass. The bass in particular is very, very punchy, and it has that great sense of punch that um, 64 Audio's other IMs tend to exhibit. Um, so yeah, it's kind of carrying there, but again, that bass response is absolutely nutty. Okay, so what's the bottom line here? I have been pretty unrelenting in my assessment of the A4S, and I'm not going to pull the punches when I say that I don't think that this is the IM that you should buy if you're after the best sounding kilobuck IM. IMs like the uh, Symphonium Helios and the Moondrop S8 are just going to sound more technical than the A4S is. I think that holds true unless you're indexing almost entirely for that juicy sub bass response on the A4S. But with that being said, if you're after a CIM, then I think that the value proposition shifts around significantly. You can't get a CIM of the Andromeda 2020, the Sony IRM9, the The Audio Clairvoyance and Monarch, the S8. Well, you can get one of the S8, but I've never seen anyone buy one. and. Um, yeah, you just can't get a CIM of a lot of the established kilobuck IMs out there. Um, there is the High Edition Viento, which a lot of reviewers, my fellow reviewers, seem to swear by. But having heard the universal version of that IM, I honestly don't think I would go for it. And you also have to deal with the logistics of um, dealing with High Edition internationally, which is, from what I've heard, a real pain in the butt. But yeah, that in mind, when you look at the big picture, I do think that this is another solid entry into 64 Audio's lineup. And if you're after a CIM in particular, I would probably give it a solid recommendation. And yeah, I think that's gonna wrap it up for this review. Thanks so much for watching and I will catch you guys in the next one.